Hello and welcome to the 12th lesson in our quarter for the teens lesson. Uh, it, the lesson is entitled The Wannabes. The people that are on, that will be taking us through the lesson are Tatiana Chacha, Nelson Yanumba, John Mugai, and Tita Jonan Magana. The song that will be played will be hymn number 319, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Playing on the violins are Marie, Amy and Elsie. This Sabbath's mission story is Mysterious Man on a Bicycle, and it comes from Portugal. Vera gave Bible studies to an elderly couple, Anna and Pedro, who couldn't read or write. The couple's son, Benvedo, helped with the Bible studies. He read the Bible verses aloud to them and wrote out the answers. No Seventh-day Adventists lived in the remote town of a hundred people in central Portugal. The townspeople were simple and honest and had never traveled beyond the nearest town, which was quite some distance away. Vera was sent to the town to work as a missionary for a year. Anna and Pedro were well over 70 years of age. Something about them caught Vera's attention. When the Bible study examined the Sabbath, Anna readily accepted the biblical teaching that the Sabbath is on the seventh day of the week. Yes, yes, I know that's true, she said. Vera was very surprised. People in the village tended to cling to their traditional beliefs, but Vera didn't say anything. A week later, the Bible study turned to a topic of clean and unclean meat in Leviticus 11. Yes, yes, I know that's true, Anna said yet again. Vera's surprise grew. She couldn't remain silent. How do you know that's true, she asked. Anna explained that more than 60 years earlier when she was a young girl, a man had arrived in her town on his bicycle on a Sabbath afternoon. The visitor had made his way to the town's central square and preached to whoever would listen. Among those who would listen was Anna's father. He listened and went home afterward to look in his own Bible to see if the man had spoken the truth. And like his daughter, he knew how to read. The man on the bicycle came Sabbath after Sabbath. Anna's father listened every Sabbath and compared what he had to what his Bible said. He knew that the man preached only the Bible truth. He told young Anna many times, Now, the seventh day is the Sabbath. You know we shouldn't eat unclean meat. Vera was amazed to hear about the Adventist preacher. Because of his preaching many decades earlier, she didn't need to convince Anna about anything from the Bible. Anna knew that what she was hearing was the truth because she had heard this same truth from her father. The Bible teachings with Vera simply confirmed her father's words. Vera was humbled by the experience. She felt like Jesus was telling her, The saying is true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that which has not been labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Vera got to see Anna and Pedro baptized because of the sermons preached by an unknown man many years earlier. The couple's son, Benvedo, was also surprised. Vera has never forgotten Anna and Pedro. Those Bible studies took place at the beginning of her work as a missionary, and the experience strengthened her faith. Wherever she works as a missionary, she is not worried about whether she sees immediate results. Her job is to sow the seed and to trust the results in God. I look forward to meeting the same man on the bicycle in heaven. Vera says, I will tell him, look, the work that you did was not in vain. See these people who are baptized because of you. Education, including Bible studies, is enriched in towns, is a major way that the Seventh-day Adventist Church shares good news about Jesus soon coming in Portugal. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open an elementary school in Setubal, Portugal. Happy Sabbath! And welcome to lesson 12, as we discuss the wannabes. That is the title of our lesson today. But before we begin, I'll ask Tatiana to pray with us. Shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Our King and Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for this beautiful day that you have granted unto us. Now as we may start our lesson discussion, Lord, please may you guide us. Also protect all those who are viewing us, because it is in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 So I'll ask... Uh, the panel to introduce themselves, then we can start uh, this side. <laughs> yes, uh, happy Sabbath. My name is Nelson. Um, happy Sabbath. My name is John Mungai. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm Tatiana. Um, happy Sabbath. I'm JD. And my name is Jonan 
I will be the moderator for this lesson. So our lesson today, lesson 12, and uh, even uh, if you guys can flip to your lessons on phone and our viewers also, uh, there's a very interesting image there, and the title is very interesting, The Wannabes. And from this image, we see uh, some Pathfinder leaders, right? We can, you can tell they're leaders because the number of honors they have on their sashes. But then you can see one guy on the, on the right side of the image, and he's, he's kind of trying to take the flag away from the other leader. Okay, so that's a bit of a synopsis, so to speak, of what's going to happen in our story today. So our whole quarter has been starting about desert drama, you know, what's been happening in the desert of sin when the Israelites left Egypt all the way to when they get to Canaan. And in today's lesson, we are studying about another rebellion. Remember, about two Sabbaths ago, we talked about uh, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and the rebellion that happened between the three of them. Now, this time, there's another group that comes up, but they were almost successful in overthrowing Moses as uh, the lead of the Israelites. But before we get to that, as always, every Sabbath lesson has a corresponding um, fundamental belief. And today's fundamental belief is belief number 17. That is spiritual gifts and ministries. So we know that God gives gifts to us in different ways, right? Some can sing, some can preach, some can teach. So we are all meant to work, you know, uh, use our gifts harmoniously to fulfill the common goal, which is spreading the gospel and bringing other people closer to God. But our leaders today, they did not use their gifts for the good, they try to use them for the bad thing, all right? Now, before we get into that, what do you think section, where we get some of your thoughts? And I'll ask uh, Jadeen to lead us through that. Okay, so um, in the what do you think section, there's a question um, that I would like each one of you to answer. Um, which of the following people and people groups others are most jealous of, from least one to greatest ten? So personally, I will be most jealous of um, corporate CEOs and least jealous of my friends. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us why? Um, my friends, it's because, okay, they're my friends, so like, doesn't make any sense, but like corporate CEOs, most of them are like living the lifestyle and meaning, so yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Probably can get another opinion from someone else. Yes, Tatiana. Um, personally, I would say I'd be most jealous of preachers and pastors and least jealous of friends. Okay, so friends is like the common thing. We cannot be, you should not be jealous of our friends in the yeah. first place. Hmm, why would you be jealous of a preacher and, and, and a pastor? Um, come to think of this, uh, these guys do amazing things. They come and preach and they turn people's lives around. They hear people's testimonies, and some even have the chance to even speak to God or even hear his voice, which personally I've never had, and I'm still working on it. Amen. We pray that the Lord speaks to you in actual sense. <laughs> All right. Uh, opinion this side. Nelson. Uh, personally, I'll be, I'll be more jealous of an athlete uh, and least jealous of, I would say, my friends. Friends? Yeah. Athletes, why? I mean, you, you're a footballer yourself, so. Uh, <laughs> they, you know, athletes, it's a given gift. They're given a gift by God. And almost not, not, not the, the normal person can't match it. Yeah. All right, all right. John, what about you? Um, I think I'd be most jealous of athletes, um, being that I'm an athlete myself, and of teachers. And least jealous of friends. Friends, at, at least we agree on that. I mean, I, I tend to think that when you start becoming jealous of your friends, that that literally marks the beginning of the end of your friendship. So, anyway, um, moving on, moving on, uh, we can get into our story today. But before we even get to that, um, there's a very interesting story I once heard. But this, this is a true story in itself, all right? So there's a city that actually tried to dare God to, like, prove himself that he exists, all right? This is a city in, um, in Italy. It's called Messina. This happened in 1908. So in December 25th, this city's newspaper article, they are on the front page, they just published, um, they, they dared God 
to sh- make himself known by sending an earthquake. That was on 25th of December. God replied three days later. There was a massive earthquake in that city and 84,000 people were killed. What does that tell us? Well, we'll answer that question from the story today. John, give us a brief of what our story today talks about. Um, so our story today comes from the book of Numbers, um, chapter 16. Um, so the story begins with Korah. Um, Dathan, Abiram, 250 Israelite men who are actually community leaders and certain Reubenites. So what happened was these men, they became insolent and they dared to oppose Moses and Aaron. And they asked Moses and Aaron, isn't everyone in this community holy? You know, what gives you the right to what gives you the right to set yourselves above the Lord's assembly. And as soon as Moses heard this, he fell face down to the ground. And he said to them, the Lord tomorrow, he will choose who belongs to him. He will choose who is holy. Um, the one he calls to come near him is the holy one. And he tells Korah and his followers, this is what you will do. You will take your censers, um, you will take incense and coal and burn it before the Lord. And the person who the Lord chooses will be the Holy One. Um, and so Moses says, you, you Levites have gone too far. And he goes on to tell them, you know, the Levites were given authority, they were given the responsibility to stand before the rest of the Israelite community and to minister to them. You know, they had that responsibility, that authority, that role that they were given by God, but they weren't content with what they had. They looked at the priesthood. That's what they wanted. And the gathering of Korah and his followers was against God. And Moses Moses asks, who is Aaron that you might grumble against him? And later on, Moses tells Korah and his followers that they will meet at the entrance of the tent, um, the followers, Korah, Aaron, and Moses. So they were to, each of the men were to take their censers and burn incense and coal. So the next morning, The next morning, they met at the entrance of the tent. And when Korah had gathered all his followers, so the assembly was Korah, all his followers, Aaron and Moses. When everyone had gathered, the glory of the Lord appeared to to the entire assembly. Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, Our story actually ends there, but it leaves us hanging. Okay. But we're going to connect and see what happened to this rebellion. But before we get to that, uh, there's something we get to understand from the did you know section, where we can just flip to that, the did you know section. I'll ask uh, Nelson, the first paragraph, kindly read for us so that we understand what some of this was or what really is happening here. Did you know? Korah means boldness. Whether or not this wannabe had much on top of his head, he doesn't seem to have very much inside of it. Today the norm is synonymous, synonymous with being swallowed up and buried alive. Right. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting way to put it. Korah's name actually meant someone who's bald, like bald-headed, hair does not grow on top of his head. Right. And uh, in Sohil we have a proverb, I don't know if that <laughs> speaks much about his behavior later on. But uh, incense, what is incense? Tatiana, read for us that. Um, incense, a mixture of fragrant substances such as gum, resins, and spices used in connection with religious worship. The incense prescribed for use is in the tabernacle was made with a mixture with a special recipe. It was forbidden to use a mixture made according to this recipe for other purposes. The incense was burned 
was burned morning and evening upon a special altar that stood in the holy place of the sanctuary in front of the curtain that separated it from the most holy place. All right, thank you for that. So here we, from the story that John just um, narrated to us, the 250 princes were asked to come with their incenses, right? And we've seen that the incense was a very special mixture. It was not supposed to be burnt anywhere, which means when the Lord told them that they should come with their incense, it means they were already ordained. God had allowed them to actually carry incense, which means these people were priests. And when Moses said that you Levites have gone far enough, he was referring to these people. And remember the tribe of Levi was a tribe that was set apart to become priests, but these guys wanted to become more than priests. Okay? Jadine, a censor. Um, a censor, <clears throat> a, a vessel from the burning of incense. Censors having form of a hollow hand have been excavated. The censors used in the tabernacle were bronze, but the ones used later in the temple were of gold. Thank you for that. Now, let me now connect what happened well, from where John left it, okay? So we see from uh, the end, Numbers chapter 16, around verse 19, where it ends, we see that the glory of the Lord appeared before the assembly when they were asked to, the 250 princes were asked to come with their censors. And uh, later on, when you go to the book of Numbers chapter 16, as you read the following verses, we are told that the earth opened wide. Remember Moses called um, Dathan and Abiram to come and explain to him why they did what they did. But Korah, who was the leader of this whole rebellion, he had gone too far. That's why Moses did not even call him to explain. So Dathan and Abiram, when they were called, they refused to come. They stayed in their tents. These guys are all neighbors, all three of them. So what happened is the Lord told Moses to tell the people of Israel to move all their belongings away from them. So they just were left in a whole circle, an old island on their own. And what happened is, immediately Moses finished speaking, the earth cracked open and they were swallowed in. Their families, their tents, their camels, every single thing that they owned was just swallowed in and the earth closed. It's a very scary thought to think about. Now, that's just the three leaders of the rebellion. Now, we see there are 250 people, remember, who were called to come with their incenses in front of the altar. What happened to them is that fire came down from the cloud, the cloud that was God, that was above the tabernacle, and burnt them all with the instances that they were carrying. And that quashed the rebellion. But later on, we'll see something else that happens. All right? Before we get into that, John, there's some questions you might answer and out of the story section. Um, yeah, in the out of the story section, we can look at maybe the second question, which asks what parts of it was most startling. Um, so for me, um, the part where the earth opened up and swallowed them is definitely the most startling part of the story for me. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's very rare to just see an, the earth just opening this day and just swallow someone and just closes open again. Yeah, that's, that's weird. Um, probably one more person. What, what was most startling to you? Nelson, maybe. Yeah, I would also say the same same thing uh, with God basically giving up on them. And uh, it's quite sad that they had to go that way. Yeah, Yeah, true, true. God actually gave up on them. I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question maybe? Um, we can look at the, the fourth question. Um, and it asks, what did you learn about God from this story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I think that from this story, we learn that, you know, God punishes us when we're wrong. And, of course, when Abiram and Dathan were called, you know, they were given the opportunity to explain. Mm. So he doesn't, he always gives us the, the opportunity to ask for forgiveness, you know, true, for repentance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from this story, we just learn that God is forgiving. God but is forgiving. if he gives you a chance to forgive and you don't, you will... Is the con consequences. True, true. Probably we can get uh, another thought from the ladies, Tatiana or uh, Jadine. What, what do you learn about God from this story? I mean, how he dealt with this issue, Tatiana? Um, I feel, or I think, that personally, 
uh, God has the upper hand. Uh, God is the, the creator, is the supernatural being who is above all. And we should also obey. Sure, obedience, obedience. And uh, actually, it, it's good that we've talked about this because these guys were given a chance to repent, but they ran out of grace, right, which is given to us freely. And in light of that, I think we'll listen to a song from the orchestra, song number 108, Amazing Grace. <laughs> 